in the mid-late 1980s. I was working in a number of companies in corporate communications. It was very clear to me that the women had extraordinary skills. Those skills were often recognized, but never at any kind of strategic or leadership level. It made me think about how many good ideas women had that were lost in their hmm. company. And that's what led me into women's leadership. I decided I wanted to write a book on how the best women leaders made their voices heard. Sally is a, an internationally acclaimed author and speaker. She's done a number of corporate leadership events with a number of corporations, um, and she's also the author of uh, six books. And if the majority of not only college, but graduate professional degrees are being earned by women, why are women not breaking through more at the top? What have you witnessed in over three decades of work in the space of women leadership. First of all, women have become far more confident and they felt that they were all competing against each other. That's over. Fairness is a huge trigger. Women will get tagged as overly aggressive for behaviors or ways of speaking that for men would be seen as assertive and visionary and strong so that men can get by with some, some pretty bad behavior. I'm just wondering, what is the pathway to move away from dominance leadership to inclusive leadership? I think it starts with how we understand power. The important thing for women is that they can't, and often they will back off because. Thank you so much, Sally. What a pleasure having you here. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Pleasure is all mine. You know, as I was telling you too, it took me almost like two years to get you on this podcast. And I'm super excited. Thank you. <laughs> I I didn't realize it was that long, but it's. It, I'm glad that we finally made it. Yeah. First time I reached out to you was almost like two years back. And that was the time your book, How Women Rise, was absolutely up and running and uh, yeah finally you are here super excited thank you i am there's been a lot a lot going on this year i'm just wondering uh, sally could you recall any such instance any such event from your childhood that has left a, a remarkable impact on you the way you look at the world the way you look at yourself the way you look at life from my childhood hmm. uh, i think you know there was a a moment when I was very young mm -hmm. when I got caught in the leash of a dog and attached to its neck mm. and it banged me around quite a bit and terrified mm. everybody who was there. I was extremely young and I work with a masseuse and she informed me last time that she could really feel where that was, that she felt that I still had areas in my body that reflected that trauma. And it's interesting because it's really probably the only truly traumatic thing that happened to me in childhood. Mm -hmm. But I think that it, it made me fearful in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm only now coming to realize that and again it's one of these gifts of the pandemic because being home for so long i was able to work on a consistent basis mm -hmm. with a massage therapist and so that has been um, really interesting to discover how deep some of those fears can be because i've been yeah very much out there in the world for a long, long mm. time and didn't really have an awareness of that. So yeah. I would say that was one of the things because other than that, I had a, a pretty uh, joyful and trouble-free mm. childhood. Thank you for sharing that. This is really interesting because uh, recently I interviewed Ross Sodia, 
And he does a lot of work in the space of traumas and where he spoke about that there are different kinds of traumas that we all go through. And as you are just sharing that how one small instance can leave a scar, can be really traumatic for you for the rest of your life and how they continue to drive your behavior, those fears, those insecurities. Just before this conversation, I was, I was sitting with my father and I was talking to him where he was sharing something that happened almost like 75 years back. And he was just sharing that how he often dream about that. He says a part of me would like to go back and ask one of his cousins and ask him, why did he do that? And I was just talking to my father. I said, dad, but it's like 75 years back. Yeah. He said, yeah, but I can't help it. I very often I get that dream where a part of me would like to go back and ask him, why did he do that? So... But I think that's where I think we need to do a lot of work in the space of traumas because they continue to drive our behavior now, as much as the society would want to move to a very different level. And I do think that they live in our bodies. I mean, that's <laughs> what I'm learning. And certainly in our own country, in your country, <laughs> you've been through these uh, larger events that have mm. been very painful. And I think getting to recognize how what happened to me which wasn't you know that big a deal but how the extent to which that continues to have some kind of influence mm. not not in my conscious awareness has helped me see how people are shaped by by different um things that happened to them who had mm. much more challenging um childhoods certainly than mm. i did and it's good to have that feeling of of solidarity and understanding with people. I'm just wondering, as I'm just talking to you, Sally, that most of your work is towards empowerment of women leadership. In fact, as per the Forbes magazine, you are cited as one of the expert premier um, in the space of women leadership. The space that you've chosen for yourself, is it by any chance connected with anything that you have gone through in your life, in the initial phase of your life? Not so much in the initial phase, but hmm. my I've been working in women's leadership and inclusive leadership for 35 years now. Yeah, yeah. And it really was rooted in my experience in the mid-late 1980s. Hmm working in corporate communications. I'd been a freelance writer primarily mm. before mm. that. And then I was working in a number of companies in corporate communications. And I, it was very clear to me that the women had extraordinary skills mm. and they were coming into the workplace in some significant numbers then. And those skills were often recognized, but never at any kind of strategic or leadership level. Mm -hmm. And I knew what women had to contribute. And I had an experience um, once, because I had a fair amount of confidence in myself. I had what I thought would be a really good idea for the organization I was then working for, which is a big telecom company uh, that was seeking to uh, get more, hire more people in New York City at that time. And mm. I had a an idea about having a partnership at a high school. And I raised that in a meeting that I was present at. I was the only woman in that meeting. I was the youngest person. And I was there supporting my boss and it was not his idea. So I didn't run it by him, which was a mistake on my part. But I suggested mm. this idea and no one responded. No one, I mean, I might as well never have spoken. And I left the meeting with the conclusion that it was a bad idea. Mm. And about six months later, someone else who was at a much higher level suggested the exact same idea. And the company embraced it hugely and it became mm. you know press releases and events around it etc and i thought oh i see it was a good idea but they could not hear it from me yeah so that made me think about how many good ideas women had 
that were lost in their hmm. companies. Yeah. And that's what led me into women's leadership. I decided I wanted to write a book on how the best women leaders made their voices heard. Hmm. That book was The Female Advantage. It was published in 1990. And it was the first book that uh, looked at what women had to contribute as hmm. leaders, rather than how they needed to change and adapt. So there was nothing else out there like that at the time. So companies began asking me to come in and talk to their women, et cetera. And I thought, okay, well, I could leave my job and I could hmm. do that. I didn't know how it would work out at all, but because uh, there was no structural setup for yeah. women's leadership or inclusive leadership or leadership development by anybody who was different than the mainstream men in organizations who are yeah. in leadership positions at that time. But I thought, I'm going to give this a try. So that's how it started. So it was really seeing me lose confidence in my idea, which was a good one, later mm -hmm. see it was a good idea, and recognize it was because I hadn't been able to make my voice heard. So that was really the founding yeah. event for me of this uh, career that was very different from what I had intended. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Experiences like this validates when people say that, you know, from your deepest wounds, you can give birth to your purpose. I would like to ask this question from you. Here is somebody who would like to get into something what he or she is not very sure about and yet believes that this is an idea that people should value. Just wondering, what are those challenges that you had to overcome that allowed you to continue to walk on this path, continue to water your purpose, your thought process, and how did you overcome that? Well... That is a good question. At first, when I decided to do this, I was able to get a book contract and then the publisher stood behind me. So it wasn't my idea. When I wrote the book, I didn't see myself as leaving the job that I had or the career that I developed in corporate communications at all. I saw hmm. myself as taking a little time off writing a book and then continuing what I had done. And it was more through the experience of being asked that I thought, okay, I think I might be able to do this. I'm going to try it. Now, mm. at the time, I was relatively young, not terribly young, but relatively young. I was single. I was able to make this kind of decision and not be worried so much about the consequences it's often more complicated for people mm. to do that they've got a family yeah. the family is partly you know is reliant on their support so i was able to do that however so i had very favorable circumstances and i believed in this idea passionately and this idea that women had something to contribute as leaders mm. was very simple to articulate in today's way of speaking, it's it's a good brand to have. Mm -hmm. I didn't obviously think of it that way at the time, but I had support for that. Now, it there were periods in this 35 years that were very, very difficult mm -hmm. um, just because of economic issues in the larger economy. But the consistent issue that I had probably until around 2012 or so mm. was that it was hard to get bookings in women's leadership. And I saw the male colleagues I had who were speaking more generally about leadership, which I definitely could do. I'd written at that point two books that were not focused on women, mm. but I saw that they were, they had much better engagements than I did. They were making more money and they yeah. were treated differently. So that was just the reality. And mm. for years, people kept saying to me, Sally, you have to get out of women's leadership. It will never be, it won't be valued by people. Well, guess what? It is. You stay around long enough, <laughs> which I did. And 
and women's leadership became a field where you could do a lot, where there were a lot of Precisely. a lot of partnerships. So yeah. um, I gained value by by sticking with that idea of women's leadership and inclusive leadership, because inclusive leadership at the leadership level is required in order to develop the talents of people who yeah. lie outside the dominant leadership mainstream. Mm. So stick with it and you'll see. Thank you for sharing that, that still stick with this. You know, it sounds very easy, Sadi, but um, I'm oh, sure yeah. only you know what you would have gone through when you're saying that <laughs> stick with that. You spoke about inclusive leadership. I'll talk about this because I think um, as we are moving ahead in this world where uh, the complexities are growing to a very different level. It's exponential growth of complexities for sure. Inclusive leadership is becoming more and more important. Now, before I talk about that, before we explore that, what have you witnessed in over three decades of work in the space of women leadership and inclusive leadership? What have you observed in the landscape of women leadership that one, you are happy about? And second, something that frustrates you at the same level? The frustration is not as great as the happiness I feel at how mm -hmm. this has evolved. What I have watched is that is probably three primary things. First of all, women have become far more confident about what they have to contribute. And organizations have become more open to that, partly just because women have been there for a long time and women have gotten better at articulating what they have to contribute, but also partly because organizations have changed over the last 30 years. And mm. there's much more emphasis in general on collaboration, on mentoring, on leaders who help people, uh, leaders as coaches, leaders as teachers, leaders whose skill is in helping people develop their talents to the highest level. Obviously, there's still leaders who aren't like that at all. <laughs> we could name some. We have redefined how we see excellence in leadership in a way that I believe has worked to women's advantage and has given them more confidence Hmm. in what they have to contribute. So that confidence and that redefinition of excellence in leadership, that's hmm. one thing. The second thing is that there's much greater solidarity among women uh, and support for women coming up much more than hmm. there used to be because there weren't that many women. They felt that they were all competing against each other. The women who were most competitive against other women seemed often to be the ones who were most successful. I'll give you an example. I did a lot of women's leadership programs in the 1990s, and the companies that, that, that hired me had a terrible time getting senior women to even participate or even speak at the women's leadership conferences they were putting together. So mm. they would engage me and say, do you think you can try to get some of these women to come? And um, so I'd ask them and they would always say that for some version of the same thing. I want to be recognized as, as a leader, not a woman. They didn't sort of want to be associated with other women. That's over. Women see helping other women develop for the most part as a career advantage. And the third thing that um, has happened is there's much greater recognition among women and among those who are supporting them that they need male allies and a greater skill in engaging them. So those are the changes I've seen. And to me, they're just tremendously positive. You know, I can see that if you look at the rise of leaders who happen to be women, let me just put it this way. I remember um, we did a conference the year 2016 and the theme was there's nothing called women leadership. Yeah. There's nothing called women leadership. There are leaders who happen to be women and there's definitely a rise of leaders who happen to be women. And uh, I think it dovetails with what you're talking about being more confident, organizations being more 
open, redefining the excellence in leadership and the support and the peer, peer network of women that you would find across the world and recognition of the leaders. If there's anything that you feel should have happened and has not happened, what would that be? Well, I do think that women still really struggle. And this isn't just women. This is not just restricted to women because people who come from outside the, the dominant mainstream, whatever that is in whatever country. So in this country, you could say white male. But if you go to Japan, there's no point in talking about uh, Japanese. There are a lot of you know Korean nationals in Japan who struggle with these same issues. Yeah, I think dominant leaders tend to hear women and other outsiders differently. Hmm. If they raise an idea or an especially an objection, they are tend to be less open to it. And as a result, women, let's just take, will get tagged as overly aggressive for behaviors or ways of speaking that for men would be seen as assertive and visionary and strong so that men can get by with some some pretty bad behavior that women never could or, or anyone outside the mainstream never could. And at the same time, those men can get a reputation for being an iconoclast whatever. So I think that's been very persistent and it hasn't really changed all that much uh, that outsiders come in for outsized criticism Mm. for the same things that those in the dominant leadership culture would never be criticized for. And that's problematic. The important thing for women and others who are outside the leadership mainstream is that they can't, and often they will back off because they feel that they're being criticized or they feel that someone doesn't have a high opinion of them or doesn't like them or sees them as too aggressive or whatever. It's of concern. Interestingly, we are talking about perceptions. We are talking about domination. And we are not only talking about domination at the family front. We are not only talking about the domination at the organizational level. We are talking about at the country level. So the question that I have is, what do you think are the insecurities that their counterparts, that is the male leaders show up in the form of dominance? What is it that they are fearful about that don't allow leaders who happen to be women to enjoy and cherish the positions at the same kind, at the same level? That's a wonderful question. And I think that what I see is that there are fewer and fewer male leaders who have the desire to assert domination. They're more and more likely to have as a skill set the development of their people. However, and especially in the political arena, we see men whose insecurities cause them to feel that they have to assert dominance in every situation. Hmm. And this is one of the reasons that the world is experiencing sort of a a move to more authoritarian leadership styles Hmm. at the country level in Hmm. certain countries. It doesn't necessarily persist over time, but They give it an experiment. I've seen some of these very dominant male leaders up close is that their underlying insecurity usually has to do with their competence and ability to actually perform the job. Precisely. And that there is some level where they're aware that they don't have the, the background. They haven't put in the time. They haven't had enough humility to learn the skills that the job requires. Hmm. So they substitute bluster and the assertion of their own dominance and the desire to assert their own will Hmm. um, for that competence. The business scholar, Tomas Chamorro Premuzic, wrote a wonderful book called Why Are There So Many 
bad male leaders or something like that. The title is very blunt. And his assertion is that organizations and voters are quite poor at identifying overconfidence in men and that Mm. the overconfidence is a mechanism for covering up the fact that they don't have true confidence because they they don't have the competence to do the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I read it somewhere that overconfidence is a sign of uh, insecurity. Why would you exert overconfidence? Because you're trying to camouflage something that you don't have. You are actually trying to curtain the insecurity that you've been dealing with. So on one hand, you're talking about asserting your dominance. On the other hand, you spoke about inclusive leadership, right? I'm just wondering, what is the pathway in terms of the mindset to move away from dominance leadership to inclusive leadership? I think it starts with how we understand power. Hmm. And I learned about this when I was doing the book, The Web of Inclusion in 1995, which was, you know, the first time the language of of inclusion, the word inclusion had been used in the context Hmm. of organizations. And in one of my case studies in that book, I interviewed a fellow who was one of the first hires at a classic, great, old line Silicon Valley company. And I asked him, why is your company so good at identifying and nurturing talent from people at all levels rather Mm. than just the chosen few? And he said something I'll never forget, and I think is fundamental to how we think about organizations and inclusion. He said, it's because in this company, we recognize that there are four kinds of power in organizations and we value them all. There is the power of position and that is what position you hold and the resources that you can formally command. There is the power of expertise and that is the competence that we're talking about in this conversation, the power of expertise. There is the power of connections, who you can ask if if it's a company and you're having trouble finding shipping materials for whatever it is, know the people and you can give them a call because you have lots of connections. And there is the power of personal authority. That is how you are perceived among people you work with, the amount of trust people have in you. So I think that inclusion is rooted in how we understand power and that the classic top-down organization uh, where dominance is characteristic of leadership is an organization that overprivileges and overrecognizes positional power mm. and sees expertise, connections, and especially personal authority as sort of also uh, rands or not really sources of power. Wow. What a beautiful clarity I'm experiencing right now. I've heard about positional power and personal power. In between, the two things that you spoke about is the power that comes from your expertise, from your competence, and the power that comes from your connection. Wow, what a beautiful continuum. You use this word, and of course, that the book that you have written in 1995, The Web of Inclusion. Just wondering, how would you define the web of inclusion? And what are some of the benefits and the challenges of creating and leading such a web? Well, a web of inclusion is both a structure and an operating system. So I think that's one of the the key things. It's a way of operating that seeks to bring people into the circle of decision-making wherever they can contribute and also seeks to identify the ways in which people who you might not have thought of as being able to make a certain contribution can contribute. So you're constantly creating pathways uh, by which people can contribute at their best and can develop relationships that serve them. So that's sort of the principle of operation 
rather than telling people what to do. Hmm. The other thing is structurally, it doesn't operate as a top-down entity. Hmm. The leader and or leaders tend to be in the center of a kind of circle, drawing people in around them, strengthening the tendrils, the lines that connect them with other people, but also, and this is just as important, making sure that the uh, connections between other people Hmm. are strengthened. So that the whole idea is getting resources and ideas to flow. So it serves collaboration, it serves creativity, it serves ideas. And I think that's why when I first proposed the idea of the web of inclusion Mm -hmm. as a structure and a way of operating, it was really in response to the shift in the technology that was happening in the 1990s, early 1990s, when I wrote the book, which was much more empowering for people because they had access to information. Hmm. Uh, Within a couple of years after that book was published, organizations began looking at the value of inclusion in terms of how to engage diverse people in the workplace. And that, so I kept getting invited to speak at these conferences because I was the person who had the idea about inclusion, but it was very much focused on diversity, not the adaptation to technology. But I realized it was exactly right because in order to engage a diverse workforce in order to to make that successful, you particularly need to practice inclusion because people who are outside the mainstream, uh, they're more likely to be excluded from decision-making. So yeah. inclusion yeah. is a strong principle for managing and leading, especially a diverse workforce which is the dominant workforce in every workplace I know yeah. around the world now. Yeah, it is. What are the other steps or the shifts that's required in the mindset to move towards inclusive leadership? Well, that really gets at what I was looking at in my most recent book, Rising Together. I'm going to hold it up here. Yes. <laughs> Put in, you know, as they say, a shameless plug, Rising Together, which was just published in the spring. Um What I look at there is what gets in the way of Mm. building inclusive cultures, because that's what we're really talking about. This is a cultural shift. Uh, And what I see is, number one, there are triggers that hold people as individuals or as groups, as teams, back from behaving inclusively. Concern differences in communication how we build our networks, trigger visibility. You know, that person's getting more notice than I am. How come everybody pays attention to them when they speak, but they don't pay attention to me when I speak? So, you know, how we use humor. There are all kinds of triggers that undermine our ability to really build an inclusive culture because we think, okay, I I don't like that person. Okay. Oh, well, that person fulfilled what I thought they would be like because X, Y, and Z. So first of all, I feel that to create an inclusive culture, we have to help people or work with people to identify what is most likely to trigger us so that we cannot behave in an accepting and open way, because that's Mm. a reality. You know, we can have the best intentions in the world, and then something happens that we perceive of as very unfair, and Mm. we have an emotional response to it. We tell ourselves a story about why it's not fair. Women are never recognized around here. They're only promoting women now, and men can't get a break, whatever that story is that we're telling ourselves. (laughs) And then that keeps us stuck. So- That's number one. And then after that, I think that we have under invested in the whole diversity and inclusion world Mm -hmm. in in talking about the importance of inclusive behaviors and what those are and how people can exhibit them and how people can act on them. We have focused probably 
too much on identifying unconscious biases, which mm -hmm. are in people's heads. That's not how other people perceive us. Too much focus on the bias hunt and not enough focus on articulating inclusive behaviors. And what I see is leaders who are very inclusive and who are able to lead in difficult circumstances in an mm -hmm. inclusive way, usually will articulate just a couple of behaviors that they are holding people to account for and then mm. let the rest go. So Alan Mulally did that at Ford. Marshall Goldsmith, our colleague, talks a lot about Alan's leadership style. He articulated just a couple principles. Nancy Pelosi, who was the leader of the House of Representatives and probably the best and uh, most effective leader that we've had certainly in the modern era, uh, she did the same thing. She had certain things that people had to toe the line on behaviorally in terms of how they treated other people. And then she wasn't micromanaging after that. So that's a very important thing. And I think we have underrated it. And really part of the reason I wrote what uh, the uh, Rising Together was that I wanted to bring both the triggers and the inclusive behaviors into mm, the conversation mm, we're having. Mm. You spoke about the trigger of who's being more visible, right? Yeah, well, let's talk about the visibility for, for a minute. Certainly the communication things, you know, why doesn't she speak up? You mm. know, when she speaks up, it's irritating. Uh, he dominates the conversation. There, there are things that, that we can feel about communication. Fairness is a huge trigger. And it's remarkable how often you hear women say, women can't get a break here. And you hear men say, you know, mm. um, women are being privileged. Uh, we also hear this racially. Oh, you know, the company's trying to, this in the U.S., trying to promote only people of color so white people can't get a break. All those kinds of concerns about fairness are very, mm. very active. With visibility, it kind of goes back to your ability to make your voice heard and to be heard when you speak. And this is a very common uh, trigger for women, certainly, and for other people outside the dominant mainstream, that they feel that if they make a contribution, it, nobody acknowledges it. So how do you deal with that? And how do you begin to use those kinds of incidents, not as an opportunity to either draw back, mm. uh, give up, or, or resent the people who seem to be good at this, but use them as an opportunity to build a positive ally network by, for example, if someone speaks up and said basically the same thing we said, instead of feeling bad about it or complaining to someone we think will give us a sympathetic ear, go up to that person and say, oh, I'm so glad that you agreed with that idea that I mentioned. The way you framed it, I thought was especially effective. So there's an opportunity actually to build an ally with someone who you could have wasted a lot of time feeling resentful mm. of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could so much relate to that, that how even I have these biases that how, why is this person dominating the meeting or why is she not speaking or why is she so irritating? How much is it my own, my own projection of my own insecurities, my own fear? How can I identify that when somebody else is getting more visibility or when somebody else is getting more recognition, I feel insecure. And then the easiest way is to project my own insecurity on the other person and then blame the so-called leader in that environment. How can I identify that? The really important thing is to acknowledge that this is your own insecurity, to accept that, an awareness of how you're feeling, not trying to suppress it. Um, not trying to turn it into something else, not trying to turn your awareness that this is making you feel insecure, not trying to project that outward as anger. So an awareness of what you're feeling, an acceptance of it. Oh, I see. I think I'm being triggered by this person's ability to speak up. Oh, I think I'm being triggered by this person 
seeming to remain silent when I think that they would or should be speaking. That's awareness and the acceptance. And then the important thing is to take some action. The most important thing is to find a path to action that takes us out of our own heads and that doesn't keep us stuck because in general, in that kind of situation, the path to action we take is to grab a colleague who we think might agree with us and complain about what just happened. And that leads nowhere positive. It makes us part of a sort of toxic network building that is based on resentment and gossip. Not a great place to be. We want to look wow. at this. Okay, here's an opportunity to build a positive relationship with someone based on what they're doing and find a way to do that very good practice. Yeah. You know, I can see that on one hand, there is the dominance of dominance. Yeah. There's a web of, as you use the word, gossip and resentment. On the other hand, we have this inclusive leadership where we have the web of inclusion. And the bridge between from one pole to another is to play with the term called power. What power am I operating from? And what level of awareness am I operating from? What kind of environment am I creating in this moment? What kind of awareness and what kind of acceptance am I operating from? If I can, either I can look at that as a threat, threat to my identity, or I can look at that as an opportunity to build connection with the other person. That's exactly right. And that is a skill that we develop. You know, I think Marshall's feed forward technique is very yeah. helpful here because if we're feeling this and we grab somebody who we think might agree with us, we can say something to them that also is a positive uh, path to action. If we use the feed forward, you were in that meeting with me and I found myself feeling, you know, skeptical or resentful when this person was talking. I'm wondering when that happens to you, you have a way to deal with those feelings. Mm. If you have something that you do, if there is a suggestion you could make to me. So your ulterior motive here is not trying to get that person to agree with you because that mm. doesn't go anywhere. It's trying to ask, you know, do you have any suggestions for how I can deal more skillfully mm. in this kind of situation? Yeah, so yeah. I think feed forward can be a great first step. I talk about that in how to use what I call informal enlistment. Uh, that, that's my variation of the whole feed forward idea mm. uh, in order to build more inclusive teams and cultures and how that can be of really great benefit to us because one thing we're doing is we are leveraging others in the service of our own development, hmm. even as we're offering a path to them to develop a closer relationship with us. Sally, thank you so much, I think. But it's a it's a beautiful start to conversation. It would be an absolute pleasure to have you again on this show, where we can dig deeper into what are the steps that could help us to move towards inclusive leadership. We have already created a draft of, if I may use this term, the blue print of how to, to move away from the web of gossip and resentment and start to move towards a web of inclusion where we can rise together. I think that's a good beginning exactly. um, to the next episode. Thank you so much for being an absolute delightful guest, Sally. Thank you. I really enjoyed every minute and we'd be glad to come back.